Welcome to Inside Healthcare. We're coming to you from inside the urgency room in Woodbury, and we're very pleased to have with us Dr. Rob Anderson. It's been a while that we've been in location, so glad to be be here yeah. and glad for that you have time to do this. So yeah. thank you so much. Well, thank you for J Jody for coming. We appreciate it. Coming back to the urgency room and our new location here. Yeah, in it's great. Yeah, thank you. So um, you know, it's been like almost well two years this uh, month that yeah. COVID hit. Yeah. How has that impacted, or how has that how has COVID impacted or affect telehealth? Mm -hmm. Is now more people seem like they're using it and things? Yeah, yeah, just tell us about that. Yeah, so certainly, you know, across the U.S. and across, you know, the world, people wanted some type of platform where you could have a video conference with a provider and still perhaps have some testing as well so that you could avoid that, you know, person uh, in-person interaction to help avoid any spread of COVID. So we were able to develop a telehealth platform that allows us to be able to do that. And would that have happened, you think, without COVID, or that just kind of really think, brought it to life? I think it really forced the, the issue and really allowed the opportunity because it's been great. We used it for COVID initially, and we've certainly expanded what we can do on the telehealth platform since then. And I know that um, I've had, it seems like friends have had numerous things. One had the flu really bad and, and went to the urgency mm -hmm. room and was able to get treated. And then also an, an, another one did totally telehealth. Um, I never actually mm -hmm. had to go into the facility and they had um, the urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. yep. So how does that work and what are some of the conditions that you, you deal with yeah, in so telehealth? We see a lot of the minor complaints through the telehealth platform. Um, some of those visits do require in-person um, visit as well uh, for the testing only, but most of the things we can uh, take care of over the telehealth platform. So if you just have some nasal congestion and you wonder if it's COVID or not, and yeah, you can have the interaction over the telehealth platform with the provider, and then you can come in, um, quickly be seen uh, by our registration staff to bring you back you do the swab yourself and you go home. So you're only here for a few minutes compared to having to go to a bricks and mortar station, wait to be registered, wait to be seen, be seen, have the test done, wait for the test result, then be seen again to talk about the test result, then go home. So it just really reduce, reduces the amount of time that somebody has to be in a facility so you can have the interaction with the provider in the comfort of your home or your office or if you're out on the road uh, in Minnesota, we're able to do that as well. And the, the platform can be anything from your computer yep. to your mobile device. Yep, yep. Yeah, we're available. It's um, on demand, so you can just log in at any time from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m., and then you can have that interaction. Um, as soon as it's your turn to be seen, you're put in the queue. Sometimes it might be just a one or two minute wait. It might be a five or ten minute wait, but at least you can be at home doing other tasks or be in the office working on some work until it's your turn to be seen. Have that interaction um, with the provider, and then oftentimes, yeah, things can be taken care of right there. A prescription can be sent to the pharmacy if needed, um, or if you need testing, a urine test, you can come into the facility, drop off a urine sample, and then just leave, and we'll run the sample, and we'll actually definitively know if there is a urinary tract infection or not. Well, that, you know, I think that's big, the biggest challenge for people to access to healthcare, and this just really helps a mm -hmm. lot. So uh, some of the other conditions that you might typically see or someone if they have symptoms, what, you know, when should they be Yeah. Them? Yeah, so if you think you have a minor symptom that you can talk to somebody over the telehealth platform about, um, rashes are another common one that we see. Um, sometimes we can even, you know, if an x-ray is needed, we're able to do that as well. There's a limited amount of conditions that we can see order that actually you come and get the actually go home and the provider will review that with you as well. And the cost is comparable as if you had a regular visit and things like that? Yeah, it's probably going to be less expensive. Um, that's what most insurances, um, you know, reimburse and that's what the, the coverage model is. But everyone, insurance is different. It's you know, going to be different if you come in for a, a test to be done at the facility versus if everything's just done on the platform. And final comments about um, the urgency room and yeah. that people may not be familiar with it. Yeah. Well, you're going to encounter an emergency medicine provider on the telehealth platform. So that's a really nice thing about our platform that's different and unique compared to other platforms. So you see an emergency medicine specialist. Um, you can come in, have the, the test done here. Um, you, can be, you can be tested at either Vadness Heights or Woodbury or Egan location. And it's open from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. Our bricks and mortar locations are open from 8 a.m. until 9 p.m. There's an hour difference there, so that if you have a visit via the telehealth platform at 8 p.m., you can still get in here to have a test if needed and then go home and have that result. And I like that convenience too, that you can tell waiting 
your waiting times, how long it's going to be mm -hmm. to get in and things like that. Yeah. So that's really convenient. Yeah, it's great. You can go to our website, theurgencyroom.com, um, and you can see what our average wait times are for all of our facilities. So sometimes it's a little bit more busy at one of our locations. And you go online and you say, wow, it's only an extra five minutes to drive to this location. It's a little bit further for me, but their wait times are a lot less. So oftentimes oh, people kind of yeah. go around to a different location than they're typically used to. Final comments about telehealth for our viewers? Well, thank you for coming so that we had the opportunity to talk about it. And certainly if you have any you know, minor complaint that you think could be handled through a telehealth platform, feel free to just go to theurgencyroom.com and, and log in there and we'd be happy to see you. Well, Dr. Rob Anderson, <laughs> always great to talk with you. Always good advice. And thank you for allowing us to come in thank finally you, again. So that's good wonderful. So, And up next, um, we'll take you back to the SEC TV studios. And we're going to talk with a couple of moms with their personal story about the opiate crisis. And you'll want to hear their story. Stay with us. 114th Infantry Company, Iraq. The memories are all blurred. I don't know what's wrong with me. The words, they're hard to find. I came back a different person. I wonder if she's better off without me. You just feel alone. You gave all to the cause of freedom. Now it's our turn to give our all to you. It's free and totally confidential. Reach us at OperationNotForgotten.com. We are here. Since last spring, more than 100,000 have lost their lives due to the opiate epidemic. We're very pleased to have with us two local moms, Lori Lewis and Amy Sullivan, to share their stories about how the opiate crisis has impacted their lives and what they are doing to bring awareness to help save other lives. So thank you for being on the show. Welcome to have you back, Lori, on the show. So. Thank you. It's been a couple of years, more than I thought. So glad to really have it. And Amy, glad to have you here Thank as you. well. Thank you. So why don't you begin just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how this has impacted you. Um, Lori, why don't we start with you? Sure. So um, I lost my oldest son, Ryan, um, seven and a half years ago. Uh, he was 23 to um, the opioid um, epidemic, fentanyl overdose. Uh, since that time, I've become very involved in um, the recovery community, um, whatever I can do whenever I'm asked, go talk at forums, um, go into schools, um, and try and educate both um, parents, students, loved ones about the ep epidemic. Um, because for us, we were just a normal family. Uh, and we still are trying to wrap our heads around how this happened. Um, but so I volunteer um, with the FBI. We go into the um, elementary schools and um, junior highs talk about opioids um, and they are, they know what it is. Um, I also volunteer for um, Thrive Family Addiction Support, Steve Rumler Foundation, which is um, uh, where through Connections met Amy uh, and Amy contacted me and told me about um, her book and a um, little bit about her and um, being a historian and she came over and feels like we talked for hours um, <laughs> and it was wonderful and so um, it was great just listening to her and and talking with her and yeah yeah and what I hear when I interview other people they're saying they were just a normal family they never thought this would happen to them yeah so but we want to hear about you too Amy just tell yeah. us a little bit about yourself and yeah well I'm a history professor at McAllister College I um, teach US history um, history of childhood history of women and uh, history of medicine and so when my family was touched by an, um, an accidental overdose um, we, I did not lose my child um, she survived and is uh, thriving and really well and happy today um, but I was shocked I never could have imagined that being a, a child of the 70s and 80s, that was not something that uh, was familiar to me as a drug. I didn't even know people had access to it. Somehow I'd missed the whole uh, prescription drug, you know, um, problem with younger children. I, I mean, I'd heard of it, but I didn't understand it. Um, and then this experience just really galvanized me to do my own research. And one of the things I do in my research is I'm an oral historian. So I look for projects that are more current history. Um, and 
I interview people, and so after talking to several doctors um, and other parents, going to support groups, I decided I needed to collect as many histories as I could from people experiencing this right now. Um, historians look for change, where change is happening, and that's where I go with, with my projects, what changed. So um, I interviewed more than 60 people. Lori, I, it was the moms I went to first because we had more, we had things in common. Um, I was just touched and um, humbled by the generosity that they that they gave in their um, in their stories, their willingness to share really really painful things, and then to have them trust me to put their stories into my book. Um, about 25 people end up in the book, uh, Opioid Reckoning out of the 60 um, but it's a it it's been an incredible experience and I learned more than I ever could have imagined about the opioid epidemic and and really the drug crisis in our country as well and for the same reason I wanted to have two moms on the show as well to talk about this you know this um, topic and this epidemic and this crisis and all of that before we get a little bit more about I want to hear more about your book but also um, Amy I mean um, Lori, tell us a little bit more about Ryan, your son. So he, um, again, our first child, and um, I always say he came out of the womb just ready to go. Um, you know, th throughout his, his short life, um, you knew when Ryan was around, he was just a freight train coming through the house. I mean, he'd open the door and it's, I'm home, and um, just full of life. He was um, an artist, loved to draw, um, paint, um, sketch. Uh, he was always busy, 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 busy doing something. He self-taught himself, he was a musician, self-taught himself how to play um, guitar, keyboards, drums, taught his little brother how to play the drums. Um, they had a garage band. Um, quirky sense of humor. Uh, he, he, you know, at his um, conferences, the teachers would just say, you're Ryan's mom, sit down and have to tell you a story. <laughs> I mean, every one of them, Aww, you know, and um, heart, yeah. I've actually, um, some, um, some of them, have, friends have reached out to me and, and they share stories with me and, um, you know, things I didn't even know about him. And he was just, he was just so kind and compassionate and caring and a great friend to his friends. Um, so he was just the life of the party and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, unfortunately a risk taker and liked adventure. And I mean, that's how I was and am still. So um, just so full of life. So it's definitely a void. Um, you know, that we all experience with his, with this loss. And Amy, it's something that you've been seeing with interviewing all these different families as well, the same sort of, about these remarkable young people, not always young people, but just remarkable oh, individuals. Right. And thing, yeah, so many, so many beautiful people. And I, I think, you know, you starting with losing 100,000 people, um, in a year, that's just an, that's a staggering number. We haven't seen something like that since the HIV AIDS epidemic. And it, it, it reminds me of it often. But I think about the, think about the people that we lost um, in that time, the artists, the musicians, the writers. Um, it, it's a really, you know, similar loss. And just because someone is, I think what I, what, when we say things like, um, we were just a regular family. There's this separation um, that we make when we're when we do that that we should probably stop doing in some ways because everybody was somebody's child, and I think that you you know the mothers all say this too like well yes I lost my child but I don't want anyone to lose their mm -hmm. child either. I wouldn't so it's anyone, no. so it's that it's that. Um, separating of us and them, like there's certain kinds of people who use drugs, which is, it's an old, it's an old trope. And I, I that's one of the things that I learned the most um, because I had held that idea as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, just too many, too many amazing people um, who can't access the kind of care that they need. One of the reasons why you have the book and it's called The Opiate Reckoning, Love, Loss and Redemption in the Rehab State. So tell us about your book. Thank you. Do you want me to hold it? <laughs> <laughs> 
and, I love and I the get, cover. I should say, too, I when it. I was reading it, I just couldn't wait to turn the next page. I mean, it was just riveting. I well, mean, I was thank you. Really I just, love writing. I just wanted to read another page, another page. Thank I was you. up lo late, longer, <laughs> I stayed up much thank later yeah, than yeah, I thought yeah. I was going to reading it. Yeah. Well, I really, I, I really appreciate hearing that. Um, the book was just also uh, named finalist in the nonfiction category for the Minnesota Book Award. That is yeah, fantastic. so I feel kind of um, sorry. I keep touching myself. Um, <laughs> my, I keep touching my microphone. Um, anyway, so you were asking me something. Now I've forgotten. Why? why the oh, why book? Minnesota? Yeah. Yes. So Minnesota. What I learned, which I did not know. Uh, when I started this project in 2015 was that Minnesota is the epicenter, the founding state for what we understand to be drug treatment um, in terms of the 12-step rehab model, which starts with abstinence, started in the 50s uh, with Hazelden, Wilmer State Hospital, and Pioneer House. And so I won't go off into a long lecture that I give, <laughs> but I will to say, take one of your classes. <laughs> I will say, yes, I do teach a class on the history of drugs, addiction, and recovery. Um, but what I will say is that the, the model that was developed here in Minnesota is very powerful for people in, who've used alcohol and maybe some other drugs, cocaine maybe. But when you apply it to opioids, when you try to just stop, it becomes very, very difficult because of a physiological um, addiction to the drug and of, to, the, to opioids. So what I learned is that we also have other models that were created in medicine with methadone. Methadone was stigmatized because it was used in inner city populations. So people from suburban and affluent areas would never think about methadone. Luckily, we have a new drug, Suboxone, uh, 2011, that's starting to get more and more traction with, with physicians. Um, and it, so there's just these different models that have developed over time that aren't really talking to each other. And what, I was, what I'm hoping with the way that I've laid this out in the book is that we'll start to see here in Minnesota the way that we could be a real leader in combining medicine, the 12-step, you know, recovery kind of community program for people, the peer support, and then harm reduction. We need, we need to save people before they die, um, whether they're under a bridge or they're in your bed, your, their childhood bedroom. We need to save them <laughs> so they can get the help that they need. So we really need to kind of combine these interventions and these, these, um, these ways to help people. One, one way will not yeah, we'll even one it. life, but more than that. And that's what you're doing, too, with the, the work that you're doing with the FBI and talking to students and the community. We're running short on time, but just briefly, why you continue to do that? And what do you um, enjoy about that? As Amy said and Lee, you said, you know, even if it's just one life, um, I when I go out and talk at these forums, um, you know, I'll have multiple parents come up to me after, or, you know, grandparents, whatever, thank you so much. You know, this made a big difference. This is what I'm going to do when I go home, and um, so that—that that is why I do this, and because um, I'm doing it for Ryan, um, and that is the bottom line. Yeah. Final comments that you want to leave for our viewers, Amy? I would say everyone can get Narcan now. Get Narcan. I. Uh, it's very easy to use. It's very easy to find training. There's even online training. One of my students saved a total stranger on a St. Paul bus. Oh, that just amazing! Came. I know. I know. <laughs> so wow. I, I, wow. I'm the just like we can all. You, if you can carry it and it doesn't bother you to carry it, carry it. Yes. Because you never know who you might, whose life you might uh, save in that moment. Well, it really has been a pleasure to have you both with us on Inside Healthcare. So thank you and glad to have you back and thank come you. back again. Thank and you, thank you, Joni. Yeah, it was and lovely. Amy, pleasure and yeah, thank you. Love the book. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's become typical to respond to an opioid related overdose on every shift in Hennepin County. The White Earth Reservation saw four heroin overdoses in 12 hours. The epidemic is not slowing down.
Do you think it'd be called an epidemic if it weren't affecting every shape, every size, every person, every age? I never thought my son would have been spending, you know, three, four, five hundred dollars a day on heroin. And that's just, that's like a bad movie, but you couldn't turn it off. You're going to make mistakes. Everyone does. So it doesn't mean that you're over. Life is not over. One of the reasons I want to get sober are for those people out there who think that it's impossible. Because if I can do it, anybody can do it. You just watched the trailer of Change the Outcome. In a moment, we'll tell you where you can see a free community screening of this film. But first, we talked with a local mom, Colleen Ronnie, whose son Lucas died of an opiate overdose, and why she founded Change the Outcome program to educate young people. You know, Change the Outcome is a nonprofit that I started uh, about five years ago, and it was I did it in an effort to try and bring some awareness and understanding to an issue that was starting to impact a lot of people. Um, we lost our son, Lucas. Luke was 20 years old. Um, he died six years ago. And it was wonderful, the outpouring that we got from our community. But I was frustrated also by it because so many people revealed in cards and letters that they were also being impacted by the opioid epidemic. And nobody in my community was talking about it. And I, I just, you know, we can't solve things. We can't work on issues. We can't make progress on things if we're not willing to discuss them. And a lot of people, you know, we just don't know some really simple things. I look back on how naive I was, both my husband and I, about something as simple as Luke having his wisdom teeth removed. And that is really where things started with our family. Um, people are being impacted, young people, families, parents, grandparents. And so I just thought, you know, let's have this conversation. Let's start talking about it in an honest way that, that removes the shame and the judgment that often comes with a conversation related to addiction or substance use. Um, let's help people, you know, we can, we can do this, but we have, to, we have to talk about it in order to do that. A free community event screening of Change the Outcome will be held on Tuesday, March 15th at 6 p.m. at the Stillwater High School. Well, that's our program for you. Join us again next month and for all the latest on local health news. See you then, everyone. Stay safe.